turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 9, verse 12 through 21 today. Title of the message, Angels in the Euphrates. And uh, we'll jump right into that. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer, though. Heavenly Father, we just come before you now. Lord, we ask that you would just touch each of our hearts. Father, that you would just open our minds and our, our souls just to hear from you, Father that our spirits would be receptive to hear your voice, Lord, and uh, hear your word being taught in a way that uh, just really helps us to um, put it into effect in our lives, Lord, to apply it in our lives and just to be changed by it, Lord. We want to be transformed by your word, not just to listen to it. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us to do that here today. Lord, give us insight into this passage of scripture, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, looking at this passage of scripture, we've really come into, in the book of Revelation, a period where God's wrath is, is really getting churned up and, and really uh, that beginning phase or, or well into that phase of the wrath of God being poured out in that seven-year tribulation period, most likely after the middle of the tribulation, uh, toward the end, most likely is where we're at. I've really uh, come to a place of saying, you know, I'm not going to talk about the timeline anymore because it really gets confusing and uh, I'm not sure I can be totally accurate in that. And, uh, but there's just a lot of things going on in this period in the, in the book of Revelation. And I'm not sure that we're really meant to know exactly where we are. You know, we're two and a half months past the abomination of desolation or anything like that. I I don't think we can really pinpoint it at this point. So I, I won't talk about timelines anymore, but certainly the seventh seal is being opened, or the sixth seal is being opened here, and uh, and now these trumpet judgments are being poured out as the seventh seal is opened as well. And so uh, it really is a time where, um, you know, the church is gone, Satan is in full control of this Antichrist system that he's established upon the earth, and, and he's just, uh, you know, got a lot of things going on, a lot of people are dying, and the world is just in an absolute horrible place. And the Lord's return is is very soon. And so it's a, a bittersweet thing for us to read about. We, we love to hear about the Lord's return. We love to hear about the rapture. And we love to hear about the, you know, the second coming and just being with him for all of eternity. And all those things are awesome as believers. We love them. But at the same time, we realize that there's a lot of horrible things that are going to have to happen before God's plan of redemption is completed. And, uh, and we're seeing those horrible things right now. So if you're a visitor here today, hang with us. You know, we're, we're making our way through there, uh, but uh, the Lord wants us to know these things because they really should, in the heart of a believer, spur us on to want to go out and reach the lost, to go out and preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people don't have to endure these things. They don't have to go through these things. The wrath of God will not fall upon them. And so uh, that is certainly one of the things that we should be taking away from these passages of Scripture. The other thing I want you to see here in this passage today is that Satan is using people. He's using them as weapons. He's using them uh, for his own purposes. And God's using Satan for his purposes. And it's, it just really tells us a, a spiritual tale of, of just how things work in this universe. As God wants to use you. God wants to use you as an instrument of righteousness in this world. God wants to use you as a tool in his hand to spread righteousness all around. And in the same way, Satan wants to use you as a weapon against man, as a, against your, your fellow man, against your family members, against others. He wants to create in you uh, a, an evil heart of wickedness and deceit and, and a heart of selfishness where you are now used as a vessel of Satan. Uh, but again, we want to we see our lives in, in, the, in the opposite direction, being used by God as an instrument of righteousness. And so that's one of the things I think we definitely see in this passage. Well, let's go ahead and read it. In verse 12 there, it says, One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, 
who had the trumpet released the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red haste. Ha- yeah, that word. Hey, so <laughs> blue. I had it. I had it. I had it down. I was going to say it right, but I messed it up anyway. So, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. And by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of the, their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, and their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this passage, Lord, as difficult as it is, as as troubling to our hearts as it is, to see so much destruction, so much loss of life, so much uh, refusal, Father, to repent and to turn their hearts to you. Father, it grieves us, but we know, Lord, it grieves you so much more. And so, Father, that you would put your heart into us, Father, that we would have a heart for the lost, that we would have a heart to go out and warn people of the destruction that is coming, to go out and warn people of the wrath that they will endure if they do not repent of their evil deeds, their sorceries, their thefts, their murders, their sexual immorality. Father, we we pray that you would just put this in our heart, Lord, a, a brokenness for the lost. Lord, a burden upon our heart to go out and speak to them about the beautiful name of Jesus Christ and the, the forgiveness that he brings. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, it is a difficult passage of scripture and uh, you know, you really see the full throw of, of the, the damage that's being done upon the earth in this passage as a third have died or will die. Now, it's important for us to remember that a quarter of the population of the earth has already been killed early on in that tribulation period. And now we have another third being killed. And so if you're keeping track... Uh, There's about 8 billion people on the earth now, so early on it would have been 2 billion people that died, and now if you reduce that down uh, after that, uh, take another third away from that, and that's another 2 billion people, basically. So 4 billion people in the space of less than 7 years are going to die on the earth in in this time frame. And so you can see why Jesus said it's a time of trouble that's never been seen before on the earth and never will be seen again. It's a horrible, horrible time upon the earth. And yet, with all that stuff going on, still man says what? Okay, all right, all right, okay, forgive me. No, the ones who don't die are still saying, I'll never repent. You'll never get me. Oh. Just the heart of man, the wickedness of man. I'll never give up my sexual immorality. I'll never give up those evil thoughts, those evil deeds. I'll never, ever come to that place of repentance ever. Will you ever get me there? Oh, it's unbelievable. It really is. Um, This week I was uh, just kind of thumbing through the the channels (laughs) and came across this stupid old movie. But... um, I never liked it back in the 80s when it came out, and I really don't like it now as I was watching it for a few minutes, but it caught my eye because right when I turned there, they were talking about the Bible, you know, all the supernatural stuff's going on in the movie, and, and so they start, you know, hey, Ray, do you believe in God? 
is the question that gets asked. And, uh, and so they're talking about this, and one of the guys says to Dan Aykroyd's character, hey, do you remember something in the Bible about the last days when the dead would rise from the grave? You know, you know Judgment Day? And, uh, and so Dan Aykroyd replies, and he says, ah, every ancient religion has its own myth about the end of the world. And so they dismiss it. They bring it up, and then they dismiss it completely. And it really gives you uh, a, a, an idea of the mindset of mankind. Oh, yeah, everybody thinks that's going to happen. Everybody thinks God's wrath's going to come at some time. Everybody's written about that, so it must not be true. And they dismiss it out of hand. And so it's a, a very serious thing, as we see within this passage of Scripture, um, you know, every religion or every uh, ancient group of people, they, they do have their idea about how the world's going to end, or most of them do. But none of them are anywhere near as accurate as what the Bible says, anywhere close. Because we find in this passage of Scripture, the name of a great river called Euphrates is mentioned. And no other religion, no other uh, philosophy or any, you know, end time book or prophetic book of any kind ever talks about the things that are going on right now in the world that we live in and the things that have gone on in the world that we live in, in this region known as the Fertile Crescent, where this river snakes through Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran called the river, the river Euphrates. No other religion is so accurate in describing the things that have happened, how civilization came into being in this part of the world, how the Tower of Babel was being built as a, as a way to reach up to God and, and as a way to establish man's kingdom here upon this earth. And all the cultic religions that have been developed have come out of this one place right here. Nobody ever, you know, puts two and two together like the Bible does as far as that stuff goes. Abraham came out of this place. All civilizations came out of this one place. All religions came out of this one place. And the Bible now in this book of Revelation, in the end times where God's wrath is being poured out, now begins to say, hey, let's take a look right back over here into this place where it all started. And of course, in a couple of chapters, we're going to see that Babylon, which is also in this place, is, is destroyed. The mystery Babylon religions, all of these things that have been going on in resistance against God, all of these ideologies, all of these religions that have come up against God, which have their birth in this place, God's going to destroy it. He's going to absolutely destroy it. And so it's very interesting that we find what's going on here. In this place was the first world empire, the Assyrian Empire, which, by the way, was the empire that conquered Israel as a nation. God used them as a weapon, used them as a, a tool of judgment against Israel because Israel had become idolatrous and they had refused to repent of their sins. But also Babylon, this was the area of the world that they became a major world power, where Nebuchadnezzar had his center of power. And of course, that is the nation that God used to judge Judah and Benjamin, the last remaining uh, parts of the nation of Israel, tribes of the nation of Israel who hadn't gone fully into idolatry many, many years later. Uh, they were judged and sent into captivity into that area. And so it's a very unique place upon the earth. And this river Euphrates runs right through it, right through the middle of it. It's also very fascinating that our daily news has a fixation right there in that place. It's not, uh, you know, a coincidence that the Islamic caliphate is in that place. <laughs> it's not a coincidence that they want to take over that area of the world. That's the area that they're focusing on. They're attacking the cities that run up and down the Euphrates River 
and taking over those cities. That's the area that they want to take. They could take any place in the Middle East. They could go out into the uh, Saudi Arabian desert and just establish a caliphate over there. They could go to many areas in the Middle East and establish a caliphate much easier than what they're doing uh, now. But it's that place that the caliphate has to be established. And of course, they want to take over the whole world eventually, but they'll do it from that base. That's the base they want to establish. They want to establish that nation there that's a full Islamic nation. And so it's quite amazing if you look at it in that respect. It's the place where the ancient Assyrian Empire called home. And of course, you know, it's all over our news. Every night you see the events that are going on in this place. It troubles the world. And one of the biggest troubling things about it is their aim is first to take over the nation of Israel to scrape them off and wipe them out, to uh, you know, just push them off into the sea and destroy them as a nation upon the earth. That's their main goal uh, initially. And then, of course, from there, they want to take out the great Satan, which is us over here in the West. Well, I wanted to just kind of show that to you, just so you realize the place that we're talking about. Had you not understood that, Uh, frame of reference, you might read right through this passage and, oh, okay, a couple angels at the river Euphrates, no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. It's a huge deal in the light of Bible prophecy, given the history of the area and the future of the area as well. And so it's in this place that uh, we find this army of 200 million gathering. And where do they want to go? They want to go down there and wipe out Israel. It's interesting what Micah 5.2 says. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Who's that sound like? That's Jesus, isn't it? He's the one that's been going forth from old, from everlasting. He's the one out of the nation of Judah that will come and be the ruler of Israel. He's the one that will sit on that throne forever and ever. He's the one. But look what else it says here. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. And so there's going to be a return in even greater numbers. We see it now but uh, even greater, there'll be this return to Israel of the nation. He shall stand and his feet and his uh, flock, I'm sorry, he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and this one shall, uh, and this one shall be peace. He goes on there, and this is the part I really want to get to. When the Assyrian comes into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men, and they shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. Now that's an important passage of scripture because many scholars believe that the Antichrist is an Assyrian. He is the Assyrian and that's why it's capitalized here. The Assyrian. He will be the one that will try to come in and to take over Israel but it will be turned back upon him and you see there that the land of Assyria will be destroyed. The land of Assyria will be completely wiped out uh, as a result. And many people believe it'll be a a nuclear uh, exchange that will happen. And that's what will wipe out that entire ancient Assyrian homeland there. And that might produce what we're finding here, all these deaths of the, um, uh, as all these armies are coming there and the deaths that will be produced as a result of all that. Well, um, the question of how can you get a 200 million man army 
How, how does that happen? How do you develop that? And many people have identified China back in the 70s and 80s. China uh, boasted that they had a standing 200 million man army. And that might be true uh, because a, another passage we'll look at says that they came from, actually, it's this one right here. Uh, <laughs> in Revelation 16, 12, it says, then the sixth angel poured out of his bowl. So in the bowl judgments, we'll see on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, listen to this, and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And so the the false prophet, the beast, they're going to be speaking these words. And and the Bible's saying here, those words are like demons drawing the world, drawing the nation. Hey, come here to the great battle. Come here to the great battle. And it's interesting that we're seeing them now from all the nations of the earth. People are gathering in this place to fight these battles in this place little piece of land that we're talking about right here where the river Euphrates runs right through it. It's amazing to me. It's absolutely amazing to me. You know, and, uh, you know, just part of it is the ISIS thing. Part of it's Iraq. Part of it's Iran. And, and you know, it's confusing to us. And we just wish they would just knock it off. And, and we just wish we could just get the oil for cheap money and, and uh, you know, not have to worry about all the, the baggage that comes along with it. But, you know, it's, it's biblical what we're seeing. All of the nations being drawn to this one place, being drawn to this battle. And eventually there will be a massive, massive battle in this place. Do you doubt it? Can you, can you just, you can see it now, can't you? How, you know, it just seems like it's not going to get any better until just some massive battle happens there that wipes out a part of the population and part of those armies. Well, I don't know, and I'm not saying that this is actually what's happening um, right now. It might be a prelude to what will happen later. Obviously, we've had wars in this part of the world for as long as I've been alive and uh, even longer than that. It's been going on for the last 2,000 years as armies have come and they fought and they battled. And and I think all these things are just another uh, indicator of the unique part of the world that this is. We can't dismiss how unique this part of the world is and, and what's going on over there. There's a spiritual element that's involved. Um. And we'll talk more about that as we, as we get into the passage here. But the first thing we see here is these four angels are released. And then we see the outcome of those four angels being released. A third of mankind will be killed. Again, we put that number around 2 billion people. Did I say 2 million earlier? I said 2 billion. Okay. 2 billion people. All right. Well, let's go back again and take a look at verse 12. And we'll just go through these verses one more time and and look at it in a little more detail. It says there that one woe is past. You remember at the end of chapter 8, it says, you know, we went through the first four trumpets being sounded. And then at that that last verse in chapter 8, it said, but stand by, stand by. There's three more woes that are still to come upon the earth. And they're going to be pretty bad. And so we've already seen the one last week we looked at it, the locusts coming out of the bottomless pit. And we looked at how that could be a a part of this Armageddon army that's developing uh, or, you know, Satan's soldiers in some way. Uh, But here we have the second woe that's going to be coming upon the earth here. The second woe or the sixth trumpet is, uh, is the other thing that it's called here. Still two more to come. Here's one of them. And then it says, The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And so again, this scene is in heaven as uh, these things are going on. John is there. He's recording these things. He's seeing visions of what is happening there in the throne room of heaven. And he hears this voice that's coming from before the golden altar. 
saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the day or for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. And so as we look at this, it's interesting, again, looking at the history of this land, we believe this is where the Garden of Eden is located or was located. In fact, the Bible goes into great detail to talk about this river going this way and this river going this way and this river going this way. And it probably doesn't have the same makeup uh, as what it did when the book of uh, Genesis was written about that, uh, about the Garden of Eden, because obviously the flood of Noah took place after that, and it probably changed the topography quite a bit. Uh, We know that massive earthquakes took place during the flood of Noah, and so mountains rose and valleys, you know, went down and those kind of things. So uh, it's probably quite a bit different. Still, this river exists here, and uh, we find within the story of Adam and Eve falling in their sin, uh, Genesis 3.24, so he drove out the man and placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden a flaming, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so um, most likely a, a spiritual thing is going on here, just guarding the way to the tree of life. Uh, and, you know, you could put that in another dimension or whatever, um, but it's, it's guarded And so is this one of the four that's being spoken about here? And I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Because it talks about these angels being bound. Now, this angel isn't bound. God just put him there. He's a cherubim. And so he's he's doing God's work. These other angels are bound. And so I I don't think we can look at it in that way. Later on, uh, we know that in Genesis 15, 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And so part of this land or this land that God gave to Abraham initially uh, in that covenant was supposed to go all the way to that river. And, uh, and they never established that. They never took that land as God had told them to. Uh, but again, that river comes into play there. It's part of the land of Israel to go all the way up to that river and then all the way back down to the, uh, the river Nile. Um, but I think, again, that we are talking about four fallen angels who are bound in this place, because nowhere in the Bible do we find that the, the angels that were still in good standing with the Lord, the righteous angels, the, the angels that didn't fall and, and go after Satan and, and go after the daughters of men and all those things, uh, nowhere do we find the good angels ever being bound somewhere. But on the other hand, we do find that the fallen angels are bound. And so I I think we have to look at it in those terms. Here's our graphic from last week of this bottomless pit. But in Jude 1.6, it says, The angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And so you see some of those angels are being bound there. Peter talks about the same thing, 2 Peter 2.4. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And so certainly some of the fallen angels seem to be out and about, those demons, they're out and about and they're pestering us and, and trying to manipulate us and get us to do things. Uh, but some of them are bound and they're not able to. And so... You know, many books have been written about this stuff, but that's what the Bible says. It doesn't go into any greater detail than that. And so we really shouldn't try to uh, extrapolate any more from it than that. Fallen angels, some are bound, obviously, is, is what's being said here. And in this passage, we find that four specific ones are bound in this ancient Assyrian empire area along that Euphrates River. And so I find that very interesting. Now, should we say that there's a, a fallen angel over Iraq and a fallen angel over Syria, a fallen angel over Iran, a fallen angel over Turkey? No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, now, it could be that. It could be that very well. It could be who those four angels are in that part of the world there that are causing so, much, so many problems and that will cause so many problems in the tribulation period. But the Bible doesn't give us room to say that with any... Uh, specifics. But certainly this area um, has 
this, again, this unique quality to it where it just seems like there's always problems going on. There's always the armies of the world gathering there to do battle, to fight against God's people, to wipe out God's people, to take over that city of Jerusalem. It just seems like there's never any rest in that part of the world. And uh, the ideology that runs along with that part of the world, uh, oh, by the way, just happens to say, we're going to kill all Christians. Uh, We're going to chop their heads off. And we're going to destroy Christian churches wherever we go. And, uh, of course, we see that going on. So it's an interesting uh, dilemma that we see over there. But again, these particular angels are reserved. They're prepared for a certain hour, a certain day, a certain month, a certain year. For thousands and thousands of years, these four angels have been bound in this one place, just waiting for a specific moment when God says, all right, you can go. You can go do what's in your heart to do. Go do the things that you want to do. And of course, uh, that is what results in a third of the population of the world being destroyed. When, when God allows them to go, when he releases them to go and do what their purpose is. Now, again, you know, being fallen angels, we, we scratch our heads and wonder, well, why is God telling fallen angels what to do? Uh, why is God, you know, working with them? Why is God using them to accomplish his purposes? And again, I, I think it goes back to just the fallen nature of man, our free will, and what we want to do, what we desire to do. When we give our free will over to Satan and allow him to run our lives and allow him to be the Lord of our lives in a sense, uh, that's what happens. Destruction happens. Uh, Satan hates man. He hates us. He hates us because we're created in the image of God as we talked a lot about last week. So I don't want to go back and, and go into that again. But these angels, these fallen angels are under the direction of Satan, uh, but we know that Satan can't do whatever he wants to do. He has to be given permission from God. And it's only at this point that God says, okay, I'm going to give you permission to go out and do this because this is what man has asked for in a sense. No one would ever actually ask for billions of people to be killed upon the earth, uh, for anyone to be killed upon the earth. But through our unrighteous actions, through our unwillingness to abide by God's laws, our unwillingness to adhere to his righteous judgments and to name him Lord of our lives on a worldwide level, this is ultimately what man's wickedness, man's rebellion, man's disobedience comes to. It's, hey, I got to get what I want. And when you put that on a global scale and people all over the world are saying, I want to get what I want, there's destruction, there's death, there's mayhem. It's uh, it's a total wipeout. But God hasn't allowed this. As we talked again about last week, God reserves judgment. He's not angry in the sense of out of control angry. He uses the anger of the world as a weapon against them. And it's quite unique to see it in that light. And so they're released and they are released to kill a third of mankind. And so I want to throw this out here because, you know, when we go to interpret Revelation, there's often this forgetting how the rest of the Bible speaks about uh, God using individuals, Satan using individuals. And, uh, And so we ask this question when we get to the book of Revelation, well, what is this? Is this a spiritual thing? Is this a symbol, a spiritual symbol, or is this actually, are these demons that are going out and doing this? Is this 200 million demons in Satan's army that are going out and doing this? Or is this mankind? Is this actual people in tanks and in airplanes and they're fighting each other like a a conventional war? Is it nuclear weapons? Is it some kind of other weapon that we don't know about yet? What's going on here? And as I said a couple of weeks ago, kind of clumsily, Uh, you know, yes, it's both. It's absolutely both. The visions and the things that John is seeing in heaven are in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual dimension. 
But when they get put into action here upon the earth, they become physical. And isn't it true that throughout the Bible, we find that God is using people and he's, he's allowing uh, people to be used as weapons against another nation to judge that other nation? We find that as I talked about. God allowed the nation of Assyria to destroy the nation of Israel because of their wickedness. God allowed the empire of Babylon to destroy and take into captivity the nation of Judah and take them back to Babylon. In the spiritual realm, you know, there are demons and there are are angels and there are all kinds of principalities and powers involved in drawing those people and pushing those people to make those decisions in order to accomplish God's will. But what we see down here on the earth is the outcome or the effects of all those spiritual decisions that are being made in heaven. And often that means war and destruction and death and the flowing of blood and those kind of things. And so I think we can see here human agents being influenced and manipulated by spiritual forces, whether evil or good, whether God's you know, direction or Satan influencing and manipulating people to achieve the eternal purposes of God. God is using Satan. God is using those things to achieve his will upon the earth. And so um, there is a test at the end of this. So I did give you an acronym just so you can remember that. uh, No, I'm just kidding. There's no test. But how, how about some examples of this? We see in Genesis 1, 2, or 1, 6, 1 through 2. Uh, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And then it goes on, there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. And so we find in this passage a very difficult uh, thing to understand. So what's going on here? Are the angels, are these fallen angels coming down and actually physically you know, having sexual relations with the daughters of men and creating a super race of human beings. Is that what's going on? And and, and because we deal with this, okay, there's a spiritual realm, there's a material realm, and which is it? Is it one or the other? Is it both? And, And again, I say it's both. These demons see the women and they want these women. They also want to control the world. These men of renown. We also know that the Bible teaches very clearly that uh, a lot of times the the nations are uh, controlled by men who are controlled by Satan. And we find that in in many places. I didn't have time to go into it today, but we find some of the most vivid descriptions of who Satan is and his motivations. Uh, You know, in in one sense, he's talking to a, a man who is the king of a nation. And then all of a sudden, it changes from talking to a man to Satan himself. And so we find that it's Satan behind that man, pushing that man and propelling and influencing and manipulating that man to do the things that Satan wants to do. And so here in this passage, we find early on in the history of man, men of renown, giant men who are in charge. And as I taught through this in Genesis before, you know, the way I see this is is. These demons who want to control the world, who want to control things, back in that day, how do you do it? Do you do it with superior intellect? Or do you do it because you're the biggest, baddest guy on the block? And like a Goliath, the Nephilim, these guys are huge. And nobody is going to stand up to them. And so if you were a demon and you wanted to control the world back then, would you inhabit the body of, say, a little wimpy guy like me? Or, you know, a big guy like John Gloyd, you know? I mean, that's who you, that guy, he's a big, tough guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inhabit that guy, and I'm going to manipulate him to make people do what I want them to do. And so, you know, I, I think it's one way of interpreting this passage here. 
But again, I, I see it as just this manipulation that goes on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. And, and we can see it in many places in Scripture. Again, uh, Daniel talks about this. Daniel goes and he prays to the Lord. He realizes that the time that the nation of Judah was to be in captivity was 70 years. And he's coming to a realization, wait a minute, those 70 years are almost up. But God has given us some requirements before we're allowed to go back into the land. And he realizes that the requirements are that they repent and that they ask God to forgive them for all of their sins. And so Daniel begins to cry out. And he begins to say this incredible prayer. And then a little bit later, all of a sudden this angel shows up and he begins to say to Daniel, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come because of your words. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? Your words, as you pray to the Lord, they're hearing it in heaven and they come and when your words line up with God's will, God says, all right, get down there and take this, take this thing and do this thing as he sends out his angels. But look what else is said here. The angel says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. And so he's describing a behind the scenes thing, not the king of Persia, not the actual king of Persia, Cyrus, no, the demon forces that are influencing Cyrus to do the things he's doing. The angel says, I was doing battle with that prince of Persia. And then Michael came and he helped me. And so he's describing spiritual things that are going on behind the scenes. He goes on at the end of that passage and he says, and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. It's incredible, describing the things behind the scenes, the spiritual forces that are controlling those kings that are in power. And uh, Alexander the Great, of course, is that prince of Greece that will come. But what influenced Alexander the Great to go out and just wipe out all these thousands and probably millions of people in order to take over their lands? Well, the Bible says right here, it's demonic forces that godly angels were doing battle with. And so we see these things happening in the Bible. And so it's, it's no different as we get to the book of Revelation, as we see scenes and visions being described in heaven. And, uh, you know, they have this symbolic feel to them and, you know, this very weird languages and heads of lions and all these crazy things. But then once it translates to the earth, it seems to become more earthly. And that makes sense, doesn't it? It becomes a more earthly thing that goes on there. We know this because we're told in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes, the plans of the devil as he's going out into the world to do his thing. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, in the spiritual realm, the spiritual dimension, if you will. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And so we must apply this kind of thinking and these kind of verses to the things that are going on in the book of Revelation. Amen? You guys with me? <laughs> like, oh, why'd I come here today? See those glazed over looks on your faces out there. It's intense, I know. All right. Moving on, the last points here. Uh, so we covered, let's see, third of mankind. Then in verse 16, it says, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And thus saw the horses in the vision, those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth, there we go, blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. 
By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. And so, um, again, I want to put it in that category. God is using these angels. He's using the forces that they are directing to accomplish his will. But still, they are soldiers of Satan. They are going to be fighting in opposition to God and fighting in opposition to the return of Christ in that uh, Armageddon army. Um, Now, this could be why we see as God's wrath is being poured out, and again, in a spiritual sense, it's saying, you know, pour out the, the wrath of God on, you know, in, in the wine press and all that. And it says there, Revelation fourteen nineteen. so the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now that's symbolic language, isn't it? That's not, I mean, it's using earthly terms that we can understand, but it's symbolic of God's wrath being poured out upon the earth. But how does that wrath end up affecting people upon the earth? The wine press was trampled outside the city. Again, outside the city. They don't make it into Israel. They don't make it to Israel to destroy Israel and destroy all God's people. And blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of blood. And so we see these armies, 200 million in number, coming to fight against the Lord, coming to fight and destroy his, his nation there, but they don't make it. They don't make it. They get trampled outside the city there and the blood flows. And so certainly you can see how um, when we're talking about a, a third of the inhabitants of the earth, two billion people dying, that's going to create a lot of blood. And so that could be a reference to what's being said here. Um, But also, uh, it's not going to be just soldiers who are involved in this wrath of God. So I don't think we can take it and just say, uh, it's just the soldiers that are going to die. And that makes up that two billion people. All right. But this issue of 200 million horsemen, I mean, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of horsemen. And so if you take it literally, you have to say, well, it's, there are only 58 million horses on the earth right now. So people better start breeding horses, I guess, right? <laughs> well, it's possible that it's a literal and many years down the road, maybe somebody will be breeding horses that much. And I don't know, but that's a lot of horses, a lot of horsemen, a big army. Uh, again, uh, it could refer to not horses, but uh, war machines of some sort, because within the Bible, certainly horses are used as, a, as an image of, of war machines and those kind of things. Back then, that's what a war machine was. It was a horse drawn a chariot. I mean, that's all they had. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have airplanes and ships and things. But um, we can't just definitely say that. But here's another thing that we need to consider. The word that's being used here in the Greek, it can mean 10,000. Uh, It's where we get our word myriad from. And so it could just mean a myriad or an innumerable multitude, an unlimited number. As John looks out there, he's just like, whoa, that's a lot of people. 10,000s upon 10,000s upon 10,000s, you know, is kind of the idea that's being uh, said here. And so it's possible that it's not exactly 200 million, it's just so many, you can't number them, and, and certainly 200 million would be that. Uh, but the actual Greek says two myriads of myriads. And so there is a little bit of math uh, mixed in there, and, and somebody has come up with, well, it has to be 200 million. Interpreters have interpreted it that way and written that into the Bible text. Rather than just writing the word myriads, uh, they, they wrote that number in there because that's what they you know, believe it to say. Um, another place that we can see this word being used, though, is by Jesus or around Jesus' ministry. Luke 12, 1, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they had trampled one another. It's that same word there, innumerable multitude. It's a myriad of people. It's so many people you can't count them if you tried. 
And so uh, it's possible that we're not actually talking about an actual number, just a lot of people that can't be numbered. And so a um, couple of things here about the description. I'm not going to go into great detail with this because there's just not a whole lot that you can extrapolate from it. Um, those who sat on those horses had breastplates of red, blue, and yellow. And, um, you know, there's no other reference to this in the Bible that we can really attach to it. And so it's probably, most likely, in my mind, I'm thinking it's the flag that uh, the Antichrist will fly or his colors or something along those lines to identify his forces or just the nation he's using or the nations he's using, their flags, their colors, that kind of thing, because certainly you see that in war. Um, but it also makes you think about just the horrors of war itself. And uh, I found this quote from Ironside, who maybe, I think, 10 years after the World War I, wrote his commentary on the book of Revelation. And he reflects back on World War I and thinking about all these people dying out there in the field and, and why they went into World War I. And he talks about how it's just a deception. It was stupid. It was a foolish war. It was just a mindset that people got into and ideologies that they were promoting. And it resulted in all these people dying. For what? For what? For nothing. And again, I think you can see Satan behind those kind of things as he's deceiving the world, as he's telling the lies, as he's promoting these ideologies, as he's you know, diluting the, the gospel message And Ironside says of this, who can deny that it was the direct result of rationalistic culture and the denial of the authority of the word of God? If education without Christ could save, Germany should have been the most blessed nation on the earth. In that country, education seemed to have reached its highest point, but with that dire results, not only to that nation, but to a large part of the human race. German philosophy had poisoned the world. The colleges and universities of almost every civilized land drank greedily from the poison streams of Teutonic philosophies and infidel hypotheses. It is only now that we are awakened to the sinister effects of such folly. And he's saying that 10 or 15 years later, realizing what drove people to fight that war in the first place. It was false doctrines, it was philosophy. It was foolishness, but a lot of people died as a result of it. And it's the same kind of thing that will happen in this time frame that we're dealing with. As people will swear their allegiance to the Antichrist and to his ideologies and to his blasphemies that he will be speaking against the God of heaven. And they'll fall headlong over those things and they'll follow him into battle and they'll be destroyed as a result of it. And so um, I know we're kind of running out of time here, but again, these descriptions, you know, I don't want to be too quick to say they're not horses, but they do have heads of lions. So it could be some symbolic language that's going on there, but we can take these things literally again today for the first time, you know, in, since these things were written, it seems like biogenetics can explain some of these crazy images that we see as we find one animal with the head of something else. And, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's a possibility at least that biogenetics could, uh, could say that. Well, I wouldn't have believed that until I saw an ear being grown on the back of a rat, a human ear, and you hear about human organs being grown in other animals and all the experimentation that they're doing with these kind of crazy things. And, and who knows you know, if they did this back in 1997, who knows what they're doing behind cl- closed doors now with biogenetics? Are they, you know, transmutating humans and other animals? Uh, certainly, if you wanted to fight a battle, you know, having a horse that has a mouth of a lion could do some damage, right? It could run fast. It could have a rider on it. I mean, you know, who knows? I, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but it's possible, Uh, through biogenetics, if they're able to master those kind of techniques to crossbreed different animals together with each other, it could be a very frightening world indeed. Well, we see though that the mouth produces this fire, smoke, and brimstone, and it kills the whole world. Obviously, a horse can't do that. 
Uh, a normal horse uh, isn't shooting fire and brimstone out of its mouth. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about some kind of weapon system here that's been developed, uh, weapon of mass destruction, possibly chemical weapons, possibly nuclear or something even beyond that we don't even know about yet. Uh, because the amount of people that are being killed here, it just can't be a, a normal thing that's being spoken about here. But what we absolutely have to catch here today is that they still did not repent. They still did not repent. And that just shows you the level to which man will go and not bend the knee, not give his heart to Jesus, not say, okay, I give up. All right, you win. They're just not going to do it. They're just not going to do it. If they're not going to do it with all these things going on, they're just not going to do it. So what do you do with a rabid dog like that? You put them down. That's what you have to do, and that's what God is going to do. So it's a, a frightening image, I know, to see these things. But again, I bring you back to, am I a weapon in God's hand for righteousness? Am I a tool, an implement in the hands of God for righteousness? Are you? Or are we being used by Satan to accomplish his will? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Understanding that these spiritual forces are, are working in the world today and desiring to use us as implements in their hands. Paul said, pray for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, I want to be used by God. I'm an ambassador of God's. I am chained in this ministry of being an ambassador to God, that I may go out and speak his word, that I may take his truth to the ends of the world, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I think that should be the prayer of each one of us as we see these judgments coming down upon the earth. God, make me an ambassador. Chain me to this position of being an ambassador for you Make me bold to speak your word as I ought to. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for your word. Though it is sweet to our mouths, it is bitter in our stomachs, Father, as we see the destruction, as we see the world being turned upside down and destroyed. Father, we come to you and ask, Lord, that you would call us to be your ambassadors. Lord, that you would empower us to go out and speak boldly the truth of your word and the truth of your son, the forgiveness that is in his wings. And Lord, that we would not hesitate to go out and, and just spread that word to those in this lost world. Father, our hearts are grieved, but Lord, we know that um, you desire to have that relationship with us in which we are not only your friend, but also a tool in your hands, Lord, in this physical world to accomplish your mission and to accomplish your purposes. And so, Father, not our will be done, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.